What's up guys, welcome back to the Green Hulk Garage and today we will be doing another stage two build on a GP1800. Now before we get this video started, I want you guys to do me a big favor. Go down below, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you haven't. It really helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. So recently I've been doing a lot of Yamaha work on the 2021 plus GPs and a lot of stage two kits on those setups. And I've consistently been getting 89 miles per hour out of them. And that's a reliable setup to get straight out the box, 89, no hassle at all. But this ski will be tuned by Dean's team and I'm used to Reva Map Tuner X setups. So this will have more fuel for that fizzle intercooler as we saw in my last video. Video, the fizzle ran lean with the Reva tunes because the Reva tunes are intended to work with their products that is why it ran lean but you could always hit up Jesus and get a custom file for your setup so this will have a faster intercooler with the tune for that and I will be having a lucky 13 pump cone in this dialed in hopefully this is going to turn out pretty good I've already begun working on this ski you can see I've got the fizzle installed I've got most of the cooling kit in here but I do need to do the retainer upgrade and the supercharger shaft kit upgrade that this customer opted for. And I'm going to be showing you guys mainly in this video how I do this and a couple other things along the way. Obviously I've got it all stripped down, but taking it apart is the easy part. I'll kind of walk you through that as to how to get to this point. Putting it back together is really the most difficult part. If we move over to the intake side of the engine, you do have to take out the bolt holding the dipstick just to get some wiggle room. The cam chain tensioner will be right here. You do have to remove that as well as an oil line that will be right here. So once you get that cam chain tensioner out, the cam chain will be loose and I like to zip tie that up so it doesn't fall down into the crankcase of the engine. And then when it comes to pulling off the cams, you do want to lift off the cams pretty evenly. You don't want the cam to be binded on one side. You want the cam to lift up pretty even in the entire process so you don't have any issues. And then the buckets that go over the retainers and springs, you want to pull those out in order, set them aside along with the shim that sits on top of each one of these. You want to be sure to put those all in the exact same spot so everything is correct once you put it back together because these are shimmed individually and they need to go back right where they belong so you get the perfect fit and don't run into any issues. I'm getting started with this. You do need a couple specialty tools to complete the job. The main one is being this valve train tool. I will be putting a link to this in the description below along with every other part that I'm putting on this ski. This is necessary to get this done. Otherwise, you'd have to pull the head off and that is just a bit of a pain. And you will also be needing a dial indicator to get the engine at top dead center on cylinder number one. And we'll get more into that later when the time comes. But starting this project, the first thing I like to do is fill all the voids in the cylinder head with clean rags, whether that be shop rags, a clean paper towel, or a clean microfiber. And the reason being is when we go to take these keepers out to get the old retainers off and put the new ones on, you do not want to risk dropping them in the voids of the cylinder head or down into the crankcase because then you will have a big mess on your hands. And that can all be avoided by just doing the simple step that takes about five minutes. And then my last tip before starting this job is to wear a good set of headphones because we do have to pressurize each cylinder with an air compressor so we don't drop the valves into the engine. It's going to hold them nice in place so we can put the titanium retainer upgrade on. And me, like many other people, probably hate the sound of the air compressor. It's just really loud and aggravating. Get you a nice set of headphones that you probably already have and drown out the sound of that air compressor with some music that you like. So now beginning this, I've got the spring compression tool with the adjustment point set to 8 and 14 on this SVHO engine. So after I push the retainers down, I like to get the keepers out with a magnet. It's super easy. You really don't risk dropping them that way. Now when you take these keepers out, you really want to notice that they're directional. There's a small end and a big end. The small end of the keepers will go down towards the engine and the big end will face up. That's going to ensure the proper fit and that's what holds the valve onto the spring retainer itself. You definitely don't want to screw that up. Putting them back in, I like to set them in the keeper kind of where they go, push it down and use my finger to guide it. That's what's been the most efficient way for me. You could also try using a magnet to guide them on or even a little grease on a screwdriver to guide them in place. Really the thing to do with that is find what works best with you and that's going to vary from person to person.
now that we got all the retainers on, we can go ahead and get the buckets back on where they go. And remember, we want to put those in the exact same spot that they were before. We don't want to mix them up because they are shimmed to match each spring. Now that all of that's done, before we get the cams back in, we will get cylinder number one at top dead center. I will be using a dial indicator to do that. That is the only way you want to do this, to be 100% precise, because if you screw up this cam timing by just the slightest bit, you're not gonna get full performance and you're gonna be losing compression. So it's important to get this 110% perfect. Then to rotate the engine, I actually have the pump apart with the pump cone off and I'm spinning it by the nut in the pump to rotate the engine where I need it to be. So now that number one's at top dead center, we can now put the cams in. We will first put the timing chain guide on the exhaust side in, then the exhaust cam, and then the intake cam. Now getting these things lined up in the engine is very, very important. This timing mark right here on the intake cam needs to be pointing straight up and then that will align with this arrow on the camshaft cap. Same thing on this side, here's the dot. This needs to be pointing straight up and it will align with that arrow or also these lines if you could see that same thing. Now remember it is important to get this right otherwise you're going to lose compression and performance. After we put those in we're going to put the camshaft caps back on. We will tighten that down in the order of the torque sequence but we're not gonna to torque it just yet. We wanna get them evenly down and seated on the cylinder head, and then we'll come back and torque it afterwards. So after the cams are torqued down and everything's lined up, you'll want to put the timing chain tensioner back in and there's a trick to this and it's kind of difficult. You want to squeeze this down while rotating it clockwise and it will compress into it. And after that, you'll take one of these clips and lock it in place and put it back where it goes. And once it's back in and screwed down, you can release it. You do want to replace this gasket when you do it. I've got the new gasket right here and I'll show you real quickly where this goes. So the tensioner will go back right there. Obviously I can't get it in right now because it is compressed. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, so now that the cam timing is done, the tensioner is on, the chain is tight. Now we can go ahead and spin this thing over a few times make sure the cam timing is correct because you do not want to be off a tooth. Spun the engine over a few times, it's still spot on. As you can see, that mark, again, with the camera angle, it might make it difficult to see it, but this little mark here lines up with the line on the cap there. And same thing on the intake side. Yeah, the camera angle makes that look bad, but that's actually right on time. So now I can put the valve cover back on and get on with the rest of the mods. This is the most tedious part of the install and I wanna show you guys how to do that. The only thing left to complete that is to put the oil line back to where the timing chain tensioner is and that'll be a wrap on that and we'll move on to the supercharger and a few other things to complete this. Remember, if you wanna do this, you're gonna need a dial indicator. I will be putting a link in the description to a dial indicator somewhere for you guys to buy. This is definitely a must have for this. So now that I got the supercharger apart, we could see the differences between the stock shaft and the Reva Racing shaft upgrade. This here is the stock shaft on the newer models. You still get a one piece bushing for the bearing, but one of the main differences this is a pressed on gear. It's not a one piece shaft like it is on the Riva. It's not a pressed on gear, it's all one piece. So this gear, it is possible for it to slip on the shaft. 
I've even seen some of these completely break off before, which is not what you want whatsoever. And then on the Riva shaft, we get a better one piece bearing. It allows for more oiling. And we also get a new backing plate on the supercharger shaft, which acts as additional support and a bearing on the back side and providing more oil feed to it. So overall, this is going to be a way more reliable setup than the stock shaft. Is this necessary on a stage two? Not entirely, but it does not hurt to have it at all. So I'm gonna get that supercharger together and in the ski, and that's going to get us one step closer to being on the water and seeing what this thing's capable of. Now that the supercharger's back in, you can see where the added oil line is for extra lubrication. And then that'll wrap up the engine work done to this. But before I put that in, I do have to show you guys one thing. This ski had a blow off valve installed on it already. And this is where the owner had tied into it. They spliced the vacuum line off the map sensor. You don't want to do this because when you're in the sweet spot of the RPMs where the blow off valve is fluttering between open and close, it causes the map sensor to freak out and then your engine to freak out in some cases and can even make it run lean. You don't want to do that. It's just a lot smarter to pull the intake manifold off and drill and tap it. If you want to see how you could do that, I'm going to put a link in the description to another one of my videos where I did the intake manifold upgrade, which I highly recommend, and how to tap the manifold for a blow-off valve. All right, so we made it to the water with this customer ski. Now, the conditions for today are far less than ideal. We got a little bit of wind, but it's very hot and humid, so we might not see the best numbers in the world. But one good thing is that we got the RPMs higher on this than what I've been doing in the past couple videos. The target RPM here is gonna be 9,200 RPMs with a higher rev limiter. Lately, my rev limiter has been at 9200 rpm so we will be turning the engine a little bit higher in the rev range and another thing i want to show you guys is a lot of y'all been asking me to get higher protection last year which 100 i agree with that safety always should come first especially when i'm out here testing by myself doing upwards of 90 miles an hour we get a lot of fish that jump out the water a lot of birds last thing i need is to get knocked out while doing 90 miles an hour from a fish jumping out the water or a flying bird so I took it upon myself to get a helmet with some eye protection. So you definitely want to stay safe in the water. I'm going to go ahead and get on this and make sure everything's mechanically sound and start making some high speed runs before putting on the Lucky 13 pump cone. And then I'll show you how to get that on and dial that in. So that was 86 miles an hour at over 8,300 RPMs, higher RPMs than what I wanted. So we're definitely gonna get some speed increase with this pump cone and a little bit of an RPM loss, which in this case, it is a good thing. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what exactly this pump cone is. So this is our Lucky 13 pump cone. It is adjustable. We got three different spacers in here. It comes with these three spacers, but you can order different spacers. I'm going to install this with the red and the gold spacer for now. That way he's got some spacers to take out in the heat of the summer to get the RPMs back up when it's super, super hot and still spacers to add in when it gets cooler out and he can bring those RPMs down if he needs to. But we got to take the pump apart. Got all the tools with me to do that here. So I'm gonna get this pulled out and show you the differences between the stock cone and the Lucky 13 cone. So here's the stock cone next to our Lucky 13 cone. And this is a drastic difference. We're gonna get much better pump efficiency with the Lucky 13. So that's gonna be better top speed, acceleration, and hole shot. It's really gonna help out with the cavitation that Yamaha has. And this thing is going to be an absolute ripper. And then to install this, we do have to transfer the O-ring off the stock cone onto the Lucky 13 and you want to take the pump grease out the stock cone and put it in the Lucky 13 cone. And in order to run the Lucky 13 cone on a Yamaha, you do have to delete the siphon tube, which you can see is no longer in here. And if you want to delete the siphon tube, you do want to run a bilge pump. So if you do take on water, it's going to pump out. After getting the Lucky 13 cone in here, we are going to bore out the nozzle with the drill just a little bit, maybe about three millimeters max. That's easy enough to do with a three inch flapper sander on a drill. I'll show you guys how I do that. And I'm going 
going to do it at little increments at a time. I'm going to do it a little bit, water test it, and keep going back to back to back until I get the RPMs right where I want it. So the easiest way to do this is to leave the Venturi nozzle in the ski, take out the cone off of the cone base, and then take this 3M sander on a drill and work your way around it. Do it nice and even and do it small bits at a time until your RPMs come back up. So getting off the water, that was 88.3 miles per hour, and I have it right here, GPS verified, 88.3. So we picked up two miles per hour with the pump cone, but I know this thing's got some more left in it. The wind started picking up, and it's pretty choppy, and as you can see in the video, every time we get up to speed, it starts bouncing out the water, and I'm not really to hold it wide open for too long and get a good speed number out of it. But I know this guy could be happy with this. He can play with the pump cone some more to get those RPMs dialed in a little bit better. When he does have some flat water, this thing's a beast for what it is. It is a little bit slower than the 2021 and newer models, but again, this doesn't have the better intake grate. It doesn't have a 160 millimeter transom plate and the gas tank is further forward, setting off that weight distribution. But this is still a beast of a ski and I know this guy is gonna like it. 